Welcome to our voter forum for local ballot measures. The forum is scheduled to last about 45 minutes and will cover ballot measures 26, 159, the Portland Parks Bond, measure 26160, the Metro Charter Change, and measure 26161, the Portland Public Schools Renewal Levy. I'm your moderator, Betsy Pratt, with the League of Women Voters of Portland. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that works to help citizens make informed choices in elections. We do not endorse any candidate or political party, but rather we give voters the particulars they need to be informed. Membership information is available on our website and at the table at the back of the room. We thank the Multnomah Bar Foundation, Neil Kelly Design, and Paloma Clothing for their generous contributions to our education funds that help make these forums possible. Tonight's forum is being recorded by our media partner, Metro East Community Media. All forums will be available for on-demand viewing from a link on our website, lwvpdx.org. Anyone who's here can tell your friends about it. To view the forums on local access cable TV, see the playback schedule on the table at the back of the room and also posted on the League website. Voters can also look at our nonpartisan voters guide for answers to questions posed to all candidates as well as nonpartisan pre presentations on the ballot measures. The voters guides are on our information table in print form and also available on the website lwvpdx.org. You can also find free copies at the Multnomah County Library branches and at the Multnomah County Elections Office. Another important voter resource is housed in the Secretary of State's website. It's called OrStar and enables you to see the financial sources for campaigns to follow the money if you like. Type O-R-E-S-T-A-R, OrStar, into your browser. Finally, to see information about the candidates and ballot measures that will appear on your ballot, go to vote411.org. Enter your street address, and the voter's guide information for only those items on your ballot will appear. You may have to click around a little bit to find the exact information that you want, but it's all there. Today, October 14th, is the last day to register to vote for the November 4th election. If you've not yet registered, you must do so online at OregonVotes.gov by 11.59 p.m. to receive your ballot for this election. Ballots will be mailed beginning October 15th, so by early next week you should all have them in hand. Now to our forum. To discuss each of the three local ballot measures, we have a trained league member. Each speaker has reviewed the pros and cons of the measure and has been trained for neutrality. They will present factual information about the measure, including the best reasons collected from the measure's supporters and opponents. After each speaker completes her explanation of the measure, there will be time for questions from the audience. Please write your questions legibly on the cards that are available. Our first speaker tonight will be our co-president, Margaret Noel, who will present information on ballot measure 26159, the Portland Parks Bond. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Measure 26159, bonds to fix playgrounds, trails, improve parks facilities, safety, and accessibility. This measure would authorize the City of Portland to issue a series of general obligation bonds for fixing and improving park, park facilities. If the bonds are approved, the interest in principle will be paid back with property taxes. The new bonds would fund repairs and other capital costs, but they would not be used for parks operations. The operations of the parks are funded by general fund tax dollars. Portland Parks and Recreation also receives some income from fees and rents. These fees do not cover the costs of repairing and updating facilities. In all, Measure 26159 would allow the city to issue $68 million in bonds. The previous bond measure for Portland Parks was approved in 1994 for about $59 million. The bonds were issued in 1995, and they were 20-year bonds, so they will be paid off in 2015. If voters pass this measure, the tax rate for repaying the new bonds is expected to remain the same as the rate for the expiring bonds. 
That is, this measure would continue and not increase the current tax rate, which is a little less than nine cents per $1,000 of a property's assessed value. If the measure does not pass, the annual property taxes paid for a home with a medium assessed value of $152,000 could decrease by about $13. However, failing playgrounds, trails, pools, and other community facilities would be at risk of emergency closure. Portland Parks and Re Recreation has identified $365 million in necessary replacements and major maintenance projects that need to be done over the next 10 years. The park's projected annual ma major maintenance budget of approximately $1.5 million is far less than the amount necessary to cover these costs. The $68 million in bond funding would supply some of the shortfall. If this measure passes, the first group of projects funded would cost between $35 million and $40 million, and would, would include replacing or building 10 to 20 play structures that are closed or at risk of closure, repairing trails and bridges, repairing community pools, protecting worker safety and updating equipment at maintenance facilities, fixing leaks, cracks, and failing structures at Pioneer Courthouse Square, removing access barriers in parks, and that's access for everyone, not just the handicapped, and improving and replacing restrooms, roofs, and other failing structures. There's a list of the uh, projects that will be funded at fix our or would be funded at fixourparks.org. Additional projects would be recommended through a public process in 2015-16 to prioritize the second round of bond funding. Proposed projects would address issues such as safety concerns, money saving improvements for energy efficiency, and restoring services that are currently closed. The projects to be funded by each group of bonds issued would have to be completed within three years. A five-member oversight committee would review expenditures and report annually to the city council. The bond measure would also provide for performance audits by the city auditor to ensure that projects funded by the bonds are consistent with voter intent. Now supporters of this measure say this. We can raise up to $68 million to fund critical park needs without increasing tax rates. Two, making repairs is a smart investment. The bonds require citizen oversight and audits to ensure the funds are well spent. Three, the measure does not, if the measure does not pass, we won't have enough parks funding which will mean more closures of parks, trails, pools, and other community parks facilities. And four, historically, Portland has created and maintained our park system through bond measures and levies, as well as donations and volunteerism. There is no organized opposition to this measure. You won't find any statements in opposition in your voters' pamphlet. Um, but there are some individuals and organizations that have spoken against it. And what these opponents say is this. One, Portland taxpayers are being asked to pay too many extra fees and taxes. Property owners are already paying too much. Two, if the city ended some of its wasteful urban renewal districts, such as the one that includes the Pearl, there would be more money to maintain our parks facilities. Three, Pioneer Courthouse Square receives income from major tenants as well as fees for events in the square. Money for repair to this park space should have been paid from this income in the last 30 years. And four, the city needs a better plan for taking care of its parks rather than depending on bond measures. Okay, thanks Margaret for that concise explanation of the bond measure. We have a couple extra questions for you and also have the chance for the audience to feed in any questions you've got. 
um, write it down and hand it to the esteemed people walking around. Okay, first question from my collection. Are long-term bonds the right way to fund park repairs? Should these types of costs be taken into account during annual budget cycles? Well, I think that um, some people might think that, that you should be paying for the um, parks from the general fund, and of course the operations are paid for from the general fund. Uh, the fact is that uh, the general fund is limited in how much tax it can collect, how much property tax it can collect. The uh, Constitution, and this is actually referred to in the question, um, sections 11 and 11b of the Constitution, um, limit the amount that can be collected for general operations in a city that are not schools to $10 per thousand for $1,000 in, in actually real market value. So the city has a limited amount of money um, in its general fund, and it has to fund safety. That's actually a high priority, public safety. It has to fund streets. It has to fund buildings, public buildings. Um, so uh, the parks would be competing for that, and with uh, I think that historically, they have depended on bonds, they've depended on donations, they've depended on levies even to fund um, the parks, uh, to fund capital costs. Okay, and it's, it's not an unusual business practice to fund capital improvements through bonds. That's right, and as a matter of fact, the, um, the limits on uh, tax revenue do not apply to bonds that are passed in a general election. Okay. Second question, is there any reason to believe that the oversight committee will be accountable to the ratepayer or voter intent and not just the officials at the city with whom they work most closely? Will they, will they take the larger interest in, in, at heart? Well, this is a new um, requirement for the parks. The 1994 parks bond measure did not have a citizen oversight committee, although they did have a lot of civil involvement, a lot of citizen input in terms of a lot of meetings, a lot of newsletters um, with stakeholders and, and citizens to find out what they wanted. Uh, the oversight committee was something that I believe was instituted with a fire station bond in a 1998 um, parks, not parks measure, but a 1998 bond measure. Um, and Eight years later, the auditor reviewed how that citizen oversight committee was working and thought it was working very well in terms of making sure that voter intent, that the, what the voters intended um, was, was being carried out. In fact, the citizen oversight committee was reviewing all the changes to the budget, all the change orders, um, and they were approving them or not approving them. The auditor did find that in one case where they approved a um, security fence for a 911 facility, that that wasn't something that the voters had thought about before. Well, it was before the bond was passed, before 2001. Okay, good information. Okay, one question from the audience. Can you tell us anything about the city's plan for the portion of the shortfall that's not covered by the bond? The um 300 million or so? Yes. Um, I, I actually think that they are not planning to, to uh, I mean, they, they have 1.5 million a year that is in their maintenance budget, their major maintenance budget. So that can cover some of it. After the, um, I haven't heard this as a plan, but I know that after the 1994 parks bond was passed, that then in, I believe, um, in the early 2000s, 2002, uh, a levy was passed, and part of that levy was used to pay capital costs, and the auditor found that that was an okay use. So there were, I think about $30 million from the levy for parks paid for capital costs. It doesn't come close to 300 and whatever, it's 65 million. Mm -hmm but uh, that may be part of the plan. 
there will be prioritization happening, no doubt. They definitely are prioritizing, and I actually don't know that they plan a levy. Um, I just know that that was one option that was used before. Okay, I think that's it for questions on this measure, so thank you, Margaret. Our next pres presentation will be by League member Carol Cushman, and she's going to be talking about measure 26160, the Metro Charter Change. Thank you. Uh, metro Measure 26160 is a Metro measure which continues an existing provision prohibiting Metro from requiring an increase in neighborhood density. The actual title of the measure reads, Retain Prohibition on Metro Required Single Family Neighborhood Density Increases. And the official question, shall Metro Charter provision prohibiting Metro from requiring density increase in single family neighborhoods be retained with 16 year sunset? I'd like to begin with a description of Metro and how this measure actually came to the ballot. Metro serves one and a half million people and encompasses 25 cities in three counties within the urban growth boundary. It works with these communities to plan for future population growth. State law authorizes Metro to establish a framework for orderly land use development, the regional framework plan, and the ordinances to implement it. This plan may recommend or require changes to local government comprehensive plans and ordinances unless prohibited from doing so by state law or Metro's own charter. In May of 2002, voters approved a measure amending the Metro charter to prohibit the regional framework plan from requiring any density increase in existing single family neighborhoods. That measure contained a provision that the density prohibition would expire on June 30th, 2015, unless a majority of the voters in the 2014 general election voted to return it. A little more history of back in 2002, Metro Council actually placed this measure on the ballot as an alternative to a charter amendment that was proposed through the initiative process that would have been even more restrictive. Voters approved the measure that focused on single family residential neighborhoods and defeated the more general charter amendment. After that was passed, Metro amended the regional framework plan by adding a section on residential neighborhoods, recognizing the importance of livability in these neighborhoods and identifying steps to protect them, including not requiring local governments to increase their density. A yes vote on Measure 26160 will mean that Metro's charter continues to prohibit Metro from requiring increased densities in existing single family neighborhoods in the Portland metropolitan area and that voters can revisit this issue in 2030. There will be no financial or budgetary impacts from this measure. A no vote will mean that Metro's charter after June 30th, 2015, no longer prohibits Metro from requiring increased density in single family neighborhoods. It returns to the status that existed prior to May 2002 and the passage of measure 2629 at that time. In summary, the measure would keep the prohibition on Metro requiring an increase in the density of existing single family neighborhoods. This prohibition would remain in the charter until 2030 when it would again be placed on the ballot. The measure does not affect the ability of cities 
or counties to set density standards in single-family neighborhoods, nor does it affect the ability of Metro to set density standards in mixed-use corridors or town centers. The supporters of this measure say that it protects the livability of existing residential neighborhoods by prohibiting Metro from requiring increased density. There is no organized opposition, but opponents would say that density standards should be one of the tools available to Metro for managing growth everywhere within the Portland metropolitan area. Okay. That, thank you for that informative explanation of the charter change. It sounds like it's one of those subtle but complicated things. I have a couple questions for you, and then I'll take any questions from the audience. Um, should Metro have the ability to set density requirements within the urban growth boundary? Well, first of all, I'm not going to give you a direct answer since this is a league presentation and I'm part of our voter service group and I'm not going to express a should, should not answer. However, just for clarification, Metro was able to set density requirements according to the regional framework plan prior to 2002. And it will have that capability again if this measure is defeated. Okay. Does it make sense for the local jurisdictions to have density planning as part of their uh, authority rather than the regional government? Well, local governments do have that authority, and it would only be restricted if it's restricted by Metro or the state. And Portland is in the middle of doing its comprehensive plan right now, and depending on the neighborhood that you live in or how closely you are following that plan, you will know that at least the local jurisdiction in Portland is increasing density in single-family neighborhoods. Okay, so even if Metro doesn't have explicit authority, it could be happening for other reasons. It, it can be happening, but it would be the choice of the local jurisdiction at this Within point. Within zoning codes. and Yes. Yeah. Okay, one question from the audience. Can you talk about why Metro or regional planning entities like them have not become active on this issue? Is, is there a Metro interest in having this pass or fail? What, do you know anything about the politics? I think is really a, I, this is a backdoor way of asking that. I do not know anything as far as what is actually the thought in Metro at this point, only the fact that uh, passing this will keep the status quo and voting against it will return to the status when Metro did have more authority on uh, local densities. Okay. Any other questions? Written, please. We'll, we'll pause a minute. I think this is one of those measures that you people might be surprised of the consequence of voting against it. I you know think that some people may say, "Gee, uh, Metro should be restricted more than in just single family, so I'm going to vote against it, and we'll find that in voting against it, they have given more authority to Metro on density." Mm -hmm when they may have thought they were going the other direction. It is, you know, this takes us back to 2002 if, if it is voted down. There are a lot of negatives and subsidiary clauses in that description. So yes, I could see why people might think they would get the other um, implications. Okay, who would vote, who would favor voting this down and why? Uh, why would a regional government require increased density? Can you speak to either of those points? 
Um, to me, the people that would vote it down are the strong supporters of uh, increased density, feeling that what we are doing in Portland to increase the density of our neighborhoods to accommodate future growth should be happening throughout the urban growth boundary, which would mean the localities in Clackamas and Washington County, as well as just in Multnomah County. Okay. Because it, what, however, Metro, it will affect the entire urban growth boundary area, which is parts of Clackamas and Washington County and most of Multnomah County. Increase. This would give them the authority to choose to do that. They wouldn't necessarily have it to. Wouldn't, but they they could. would correct it. It would right now. They cannot require more density in single family neighborhoods. In single family neighborhoods, and it was people that felt Metro was overreaching their authority back in 2002 that put the more restrictive measure on that wouldn't have let them increased density anywhere. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so why would regional governments inc require increases in density? I, I sorry, uh, they would require the increased density to uh, Help have a place for our anticipated population growth. Which is which already being contemplated in the districts that you talked about, but not necessarily in single-family homes neighborhoods, yes. except in Portland. Yes, it is being contemplated in the town centers, and I happen to live close to a transportation corridor where it is. We have single-family homes, but we are definitely working on increasing density within our neighborhood. A large portion of our single-family homes have been rezoned for much denser population. Okay, so I, I think I have a question that says, is the area where the new, I th guess it's the southbound max line going, is that part of metro territory or Multnomah County? And that one I can answer. It runs from Multnomah County into Clackamas County, into Milwaukee and into Oregon. And, and that Oregon is City. within the urban growth boundary. And that is within the urban growth boundary. It's, that's within Metro's jurisdiction. Yes. But it would also be a transportation corridor, so it wouldn't be affected by this particular provision anyway. They can already require increased density there. Okay. Okay, I think I'm gonna wrap that one up for this question. Thank you, Carol. Our next presentation will be by League member Mary McWilliams, and she'll be talking about Measure 26161, the Portland Public Schools Renewal Levy. Thank you. I'm only talking about the Portland Public School District, no other um, school district that's in Portland or Multnomah County. The official title, Portland Public Schools Levy Renewal for Schools and Educational Programs. The question, shall district support schools redirect funds from urban renewal, levy $1.99 per 1,000 assessed value for five years beginning 2015? What is the financial impact? Levy cost to ratepayers would remain at $1.99 per $1,000 assessed property value as approved in 2011 and extends the existing five-year levy through May 2020. The renewed levy will produce revenue to support teaching positions and programs and to reduce class size. So essentially, this measure renews current local option taxes. Here is the background. In November 2006, and again in May 2011, voters approved Portland Public Schools' five-year operating levies by a substantial vote. The 2011 levy currently supports teaching positions, reduced class size, and comprehensive programming to support over 48,000 students in 85 schools. 
Due to then existing state laws related to property tax limitations and revenue distribution, redistribution, a portion of the 2011 Portland Public Schools local option levy was redirected to the Portland Urban Renewal Districts. During, 20, during 2013, the Oregon Legislature unanimously approved legislation ensuring that funds from voter-approved local option levies go to the purposes intended by the levies. Specifically, local option levies approved after January 2013 are excluded from the obligation to divide tax revenue with urban renewal districts. It is estimated that approximately $4 million per year can be recovered for the Portland Public Schools District by taking advantage of the 2013 legislation. Portland Public Schools has chosen to ask voters to renew their levy a year before a current levy would have expired to take advantage of the 2013 legislation and recover approximately $4 million in the first year of this new levy. Now a summary of the levy measure. This levy would extend the existing Portland Public Schools local option for an additional four years. There would be no changes in the purpose of the levy and the tax rate approved in the 2011 levy would remain the same at $1.99 per $1,000 assessed value. Upon approval, this levy would replace the original levy. Under legislation passed unanimously during the 2013 legislative session, additional revenue of approximately $4 million per year that otherwise would have been redistributed to Portland urban renewal districts would go to Portland Public Schools. The levy would be effective for four years beyond the duration of the existing local option levy. Revenue from the levy would be used for continued funding of teaching positions, support reduced class size, and support programs for a comprehensive education. If the levy passes, Portland Public Schools will not collect the final year of the existing local option levy, but will collect the existing rate under the newly approved levy, resulting in no increased costs to ratepayers. Review by the Citizens Budget Committee and Board Commission Performance Audience audits will continue as required by the 2011 levy. Since this local option levy, all funds raised would be used exclusively for Portland students in Portland Public Schools, and none of the funds will go to the state for distribution under the state school funding formula. Should this levy fail, the existing 2011 local option levy would remain in force for one more year. Next, I'm going to talk about what supporters or opponents say, but I have to tell you that neither of the supporters or opponents say are in uh, the League of Women Voters, Voters Guide as it went to press before we knew that there were any, um, any opposition. So let me say, tell you what supporters say, and I'm taking the two supporters' remarks from the Multnomah, Multnomah Voters pamphlet put out by the Multnomah Board of Elections. The first one, renewing the levy now at the state tax rate means that even though the tax rate will not increase, the schools will receive four million in additional money next year. Because of the change in state law, Funds from this renewed local option levy will no longer be diverted to urban renewal districts. Two, independent citizen oversight required by the measure ensures that the money from the levy will be used for the important purposes voters intended, funding teacher positions, lowering class sizes, and supporting enriched, well-rounded educational programs. Now, what do the opponents say? And I'm gonna take two, and they're both from the Oregonian, 
Oregonian editorial in opposition. The first one, since the economy is improving, the school district is getting more money now from the state and city than it got in previous years, so it does not need to renew the levy at the same tax rate as a previous levy. Number two, the current tax rate of $1.99 per $1,000 assessed value is the state's highest rate for a school local option levy. To take advantage of the change in state law, the district should have renewed the levy at a lower tax rate. The district still would have benefited, but taxpayers would have benefited too. Now I'm gonna do a possible results of a yes vote. If enough voters vote yes, Portland School District would continue to fund additional teaching positions and programs with local option revenue of approximately $64.3 million in the first year, plus growth due to estimated increases in property values through 2020. This estimate includes approximately $4 million that otherwise would go to the Portland Development Commission for urban renewal. The tax rate would remain at $1.99 per $1,000 through 2020 because Portland Public Schools would not collect the final year of the current local option levy approved in 2011. Probable results of a no vote. If enough voters vote no, Portland Public Schools will have one year of revenue from the existing bond measure at the rate of $1.99 per $1,000 um, tax assessment. The current local option levy will end in 2015. To continue this type of program support beyond 2015, Portland Public Schools would then need approval from voters for a new local option levy starting in 2016. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Thank you for that, for that presentation, Mary. Um, I think you've sort of implied, and I think, you, I think we've, I can, Pick out the answer to this one based on what you said, but would you describe this levy as time critical? It depends. <laughs> if, if you support this levy, you would say, uh, well, of course it's time critical. We will gain $5 million if we uh, put this uh, levy on now, we'll, and, and uh, that will make us look fiscally responsible as a school board. But I think opponents would say, no, it's not time critical. You've got another year in this levy. These are good economic times, and more money is coming into the school district. Therefore, there should uh, you should um, let this um, legis this levy end in 2015. If they do another levy in 2016, it should be at a much lower property tax rate. Okay. Can you talk anything about the what effect? Would the the urban renewal districts would feel uh, if this levy uh, passes? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but um, if I miss a critical point, if uh, Carol and Margaret would join in. Uh, I think the yes people might say that this levy is in regard to new state legislation. So it is the intent of the state legislature uh, that, that the school district is being infected and and th that the school district should take advantage of it. So it's the state legislature who's giving us this opportunity. Um, and I think the no side might say, uh, well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't talk about um, the rest of it. But Portland Public Schools spent years getting less money because of the money being deferred, diverted to the urban renewal districts. And the 2013 legislation wants money not to be diverted to the urban renewal districts and go to the schools. So they would urge you to vote yes on this. The no side might say, having money go to urban renewal was the original intent and urban districts may not be able to grow the economy in that district without this money. 
Okay, any other comments on that one? Presumably the districts would have to do, some, the urban renewal districts would have to do some prioritizing. Okay, I've got two questions that are sort of flip side of the same point. They're wondering what the relationship is of the four, the four million dollars in additional revenue that they would get, how that compares with the overall uh, school district budget, or more specifically, how it compares with the overall revenue from the levy, which I see as being about 65 million. Can, hmm. Do you know anything about how that compares to the overall school budget? I don't, but maybe Carol or Margaret might. <laughs> the four million is, a, is less than about three to four percent of, of the overall levy, if my numbers are right. The main source of school funding is, is port property taxes this, that, that comes through the state. This is something that, a measure that Portland passes on itself uh, because we've got more complicated school needs than the rest of the state has in a lot of ways. How does the four million compare to either the overall school budget or in this case the, the levy, overall levy budget? That's, that's not what you're going to answer. No, that's not what I was going to answer, so I will stay quiet. Okay. It's a good question. It's a good question, but I don't know the answer to it. Yeah, so I can tell you that it's, it's $4 million out of the $65 million, roughly $65 million a year from the levy, but how that compares to the school budget, we'd have to go look. I think, any other questions from the audience on this one? Written question? Okay. Okay. Um, add, while she's writing, adding back on that levy, I did not look up the actual numbers on this, so I'm speaking just ad hoc here, but Typically, a levy is affected by compression, meaning there isn't enough money out there to take care of all of the things that we've said we can collect money for. And I think with urban renewal coming out of the picture, the compression factor is not as great, which is what I was going to answer before, and then realized you'd asked a different question. So. Um, I, I'd actually like to say something more about that because what urban renewal is losing from the taxes that are collected with this levy is $7.5 million. And the $4 million that the schools get is because, because of compression, because the schools can only get $5 per thousand dollars of assessed value. And so the rest of that 3.5 million that was going to urban renewal does not go back to urban renewal, it goes to other levies. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so question I think is following up on both the points that you were making there. Uh, dollar ninety nine per thousand is the tax rate. Do the schools really get that or does the mystery of compression affect the real amount of how much they do get, and the answer is yes, but it's complicated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's right. And actually, if, if, you're, if you're curious, the League's Action Committee this month is having a presentation by the guy from the Tax com uh, Commission who is the expert on all things tax-related, and he's, he's very good, and if you really want to know, you can come and listen to it. It's this Friday after next, I think. Okay, I think we're going to end this part of the, com of the discussion. Thank you, Mary. This concludes the local measure portion of tonight's forum. I thank each of the speakers for participating and thanks also to our volunteers. Please check our website, lwvpdx.org, to view all our forums on demand and for replay dates, times, and channels for local access cable TV. Pick up the League of Women Voters Guide here and at your local public library. Online, you can check vote411.org for a preview of your personal ballot. Election day is November 4th. As in all Oregon elections, you will receive a mail-in ballot. Ballots must be mailed back early, 
by Halloween, or delivered to an official drop-off site anywhere in Oregon no later than 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 4th. Postmarks do not count. This is Betsy Pratt for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember that your vote counts.